Welcome, everybody. My name is Robert Savage. I started a project called pi for j about two years ago this, this fall, and I am excited to be here today. This is my first DevOx, my first time in Belgium, and uh, the beer is great. Uh, very excited to be here, and we are going to talk about, we're going to divide the, the session kind of into two different focuses. The first thing we're going to talk about is the ability to use pi for j Sorry. Okay. Sorry, some technical difficulties why we started a little late. Um, so we're going to start with a Pi4J overview and some introductory concepts. If you attended the talk yesterday, the university talk, then there's a good chance that there's going to be some, uh, we're, going to, we're going to go over some of the same material, and that'll help reinforce it. Um, and for the rest of us, I'm sorry? Okay. So we are going to first talk about Pi4J and then introduce you to the how you use Pi4J and kind of we'll do some code demos. We're going to do some demonstration. I'm sorry, guys. Is there a problem? Because I'm switching between three different devices. Okay, but I don't get any from you. Okay. Okay. Sorry. When you're dealing with a lot of hardware and you're bringing lots of components across the, uh, across the Atlantic to, to Europe, there's uh, some challenges, power conversions, power supplies that only work on US 110, and then we've got, I've got my own HDMI switcher set up for the, all the different things I want to show you. So that just makes things extremely complicated, and we may have a few more glitches along the way. Um, so we're going to do our Pi4J overview, kind of introduce you to what the project is. We're going to go through some code examples to show you how you can implement this on your own Raspberry Pis. And then we're going to switch focuses and we're going to talk about smart devices and how we could potentially use Raspberry Pis and Pi4J to create smart devices, to create our own Internet of Things devices, kind of a DIY smart devices because we're Java programmers, we're empowered to do this, and, and small embedded platforms like the Raspberry Pi help empower us to do these kind of goals. So we're going to talk about that, and then we're going to talk a little bit, just a little bit on MQTT, kind of a communications protocol for mul aggregating multiple devices and, and, and endpoints together so you can aggregate data and make intelligent decisions across multiple platforms. So uh, just before we get started, a quick show of hands as to who has ra Raspberry Pis? Who's purchased one? Okay, well, I'm talking to the right group then. Who has, who's familiar with Pi4J? Okay, that's good. And who's actually coded and used Pi4J? Excellent. So, so you guys are probably already experts at this, but for the rest of the audience, we'll go through a little bit of introductory. Um, what is Pi4J? So fundamentally, Pi4J is an open source project that was created specifically for the Raspberry Pi platform when, when the platform first came out because the, the Raspberry Pi platform was created in university to help encourage young, the youth of of Britain and, of course, the world to get engaged in the platform. Well, I thought that was an, an amazing idea. I really gravitated towards their concept. Uh, myself, I started learning at a very young age, you know, like in 1980 on programming. And, you know, what we had accessible to us were these kind of low-level devices. And I had Commodore computers. So when you turn the system on, you, you have, you're, you're staring at a prompt and you have to start programming. So that's, that's kind of where I got my start so I could relate to the, to the message behind the Raspberry Pi. But what I wanted to do was to make that experience accessible for two reasons. To accessible to Java programmers so that youth could also leverage the Raspberry Pi and our programming language, Java, to, to create projects that they could interact with their real-world devices and sensors. And then kind of on a personal reason I wanted to create it was that, so that I myself could create my own embedded devices and make my home smart. So that's kind of the reason why I created the project in the first place. So Pi4J is an open source project that provides Java programmers a low-level I.O. access library. It's an object-oriented API because we as Java programmers prefer to model things kind of based on the real world and we want to interact with objects rather than a, you know, rather than a utility kind of procedural type of implementation. And then I felt it was also extremely important to bring an event-based API to, to Java programmers so that when we sense something in the I.O. state of the Raspberry Pi, we can event that up and you can handle it just at, you know, in an event handler. Um, and then Pi4J is built directly with Java code, so it's pure Java plus some C code for our J and I access to some of the low-level communications uh, and memory of the, of the Raspberry Pi. 
Now, you as consumers don't have to concern yourselves with the C in Java. We've kind of abstracted that for you. Uh, but just be aware that that's there. There is a native library that allows us to be optimized for that platform. So when we say low-level I.O. interfaces, what do we really mean? Well, the Raspberry Pi has a number of different periphery devices, periphery access that it, that it gives to us on a header pin. On that header pin, we can access its digital interfaces. Digital inter interfaces, GPIO, and pulse width modulation. So general purpose input output and pulse width modulation. Digital interfaces um, just means that it's binary, it's on off. We also have data interfaces, and that's where if you need to communicate with other chips, other hardware on your circuit, uh, or perhaps a remote device via serial communication, uh, there are data interfaces that we can access on the Pi. And, and Pi4j does provide access to all of these natively, as well as it also has some concepts for analog inputs. So if you need to measure voltage or measure some distance kind of thing, that might be an analog input. However, the, the Raspberry Pi hardware doesn't have any analog capability on it, so you'd have to um, include some additional analog conversion chips, aided uh, DAX and uh, analog to digital. Um, you'd have to cr have these periphery devices connected, and then you'd communicate th to it through one of the data interfaces. But there are some analog capabilities in Pi4j, um, but just realize that that's an asterisk because you have to go through an intermediary piece of chip, piece of hardware. So GPIO, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with GPIO, we access GPIO on the header pins on the Raspberry Pi. So on our top diagram, we have, uh, on the original version of the Pi, there was a 26-pin header. So those, those connectors you can connect wires to, and the ones denoted in yellow on the bottom graphic are, are the GPIO pins that you have access to. So GPIO pins are, can be represented in, in one of two states, high or low. Think on and off, or one and zero. High and low electrically are represented by a positive 3.3 volts, represents high, and zero volts represents low. So that's the signaling, kind of how the GPIO pin works, that's the signaling layer, so that if you're outputting 3.3 volts on that GPIO pin, that it's high, and if you're outputting zero volts, it's in a low state. Um, there are different models of Raspberry Pis, including, I think as of Monday, we have a new A plus model. Uh, so there's the original A and B models, there's a B plus model, now an A plus model, and we also have the compute mod module, which is an embedded um, device that's in, a, that's in a DIM form factor that you can directly embed into your own hardware. Uh, and it offers a, an impressive 46 GPIO pins for us. So, ras so the Raspberry Pi offers this hardware capability, and Pi4j helps us as Java programmers access that. And we can access all of the different models and the different GPIO configurations. So if we were to connect an oscilloscope to a GPIO pin, and we were to fluctuate that pin, let's just say we pulse it on and off, this is what the output would look like. As the signal goes high, the, the pin being 3.3 volts, we, we see that the, uh, the square wave up here, we're, we're in the high state, and then we drop to a low state. So this is electrically what pulsing a, a G, GPIO pin would look like, high, low, high, low. It's a square wave, um, just simple ons and offs. So if you want to wire your sensor or your device up to Raspberry Pi, you have to connect it to one of these GPIO pins. And I mentioned there are different models of, GP, of Raspberry Pis that offer different pin configurations. Um, so in your programming environment, you have to know what your, the pin address is that you're going to connect to. So if you go to pi4j.com and you select the model of your Raspberry Pi, you can see these graphics in, in larger detail um, and determine what pin address that you would need to configure for the, the very specific pin that you're going to connect to. So let's talk a little bit first about GPIO outputs. Uh, outputs are the simpler of the two. Outputs are the ability for us as programmers to, sign to tell this GPIO pin to go high or go low. And what can we do with outputs? We can control things. We can control, uh, we have a demo board here, and we can control, uh, we have a strobe light, we have a signal bell, we've got a little LED ring around a button. And of course, things in our, in our real world, we can control lighting and motors and power of different devices, depending on the hardware configuration that you, that you, can, that you use. But just think that GPIO outputs are used to control things on off. So if we look at a very simple GPIO circuit, uh, we've got our, an LED 
connected directly to the Raspberry Pi's pin headers. The Raspberry Pi, as I mentioned, when we output 3.3 volts, it's high level. It's, it's a fairly low voltage, so there, there's not a lot of circuitry or, or de periphery devices that are going to operate at something that low power and, and low current, that the Raspberry Pi doesn't offer a lot of current on these pins. It's not really, they're not really intended to drive your endpoint device. They're really intended to drive some other piece of a circuit or a relay or, or a solid state or a transistor to, to control other parts of your circuit, which then control the high voltage or high current. Uh, we'll look at that here, an example of that here in a minute. But uh, an LED is a very low voltage, low current consuming device. So this is kind of the hello world of this hardware uh, type of program that you might implement. So you've, you've got your LED, and, it, and a red LED operates at 1.52 volts, somewhere in there. So we have to have a resistor to reduce the voltage and current to be acceptable for the LED. So with this circuit, we could, in our program, tell, create a GPIO pin, an output pin. We could um, signal that output pin high, and that would, of course, turn our light on. We signal it low, it turns it off. Now, I was talking about the ability to control other devices, right? The, the, the LED's cool and all, and you know it's fun to see blinky little lights, but at the end of the day, I want to control real-world things. That's my goal. So we have a relay board. One more technical difficulty. Here we go. So we've got a relay board that uh, we're going to connect to, and we have to provide power to the relay board for its circuitry to run, but then we're going to connect our two GPIO outputs, number 12 and 13 up there, and that's going to connect to input signals of this relay board. So when we signal those output pins high, it's going to, it's going to, con to trip this relay. And so with this very low voltage, low, low current, we can signal this relay board to activate one of the relays that, that, that's on board. And then we can use a higher voltage circuit on the back side of the relay. So when the relay switches, we'll close the circuit for the higher voltage circuit. And that's how we can, can control things. And that's how we're set up here in our demo board. And we'll run an example here in just a second. So first, let's take a look at what the code would look like. So these are Pi4J interfaces. You import the Pi4J libraries into your Java project. The first thing you have to do is you have to, you have to get reference to a controller. And we have a factory pattern that lets you get an instance of a GPIO controller. So the very first thing you do, you create yourself a GPIO controller. And then you can create input or output objects. Here we're creating a GPIO uh, digital output object, and we've named it output. We use our controller to provision that output meaning that we're going to, when, we, when we call this provisioning function, we're going to configure the hardware for that pin to, to know that it's a GPIO output, and we're going to configure other things like um, on an input pin, we would configure uh, listening threads and things like that to, to, to deal with eventing. But the provisioning allows us to basically reserve this pin for our, for our usages and to configure it on the hardware. We do have to provide the address. We, we were talking a second ago about addressing. We do have to provide the address that we want to use for this pin. And then we can optionally tell it whether we want to, it to, get to start when we instantiate this into a low or high state. Once we have our output object, we can now use simple methods, our object-oriented interface, we can use simple methods to signal it high or signal it low. Those are the primary two methods you'd, you'd use with an output object, but we do also have some utility functionality. We offer you know, the ability to toggle the state, which would invert it from high to low. We can pulse it for a duration, meaning that you can say, I want this output to go high for 300 milliseconds. Uh, and a pulse can be a blocking or non-blocking call, depending on what your program needs. Um, not listed here, but we also have blink functionality. So if you wanted to, to, to tell something to just blink constantly, we have a function for that as well. So, you can kind of see that we've created an object, we, we've provisioned that object with our controller, and now we can operate on that object. And that's, and that's all you have to do in your Java code, and now that's going to actually control hardware. So let's take a look at that now. We're going to switch over to, oops, not that one. 